Hello and welcome to Mostly True Psychiatry Me, Dr. Mellon, and the long videos. Um, this is going to be another one. There's just a lot to cover for the mental status exam, so let's not waste too long in the intro. So here we go. So today, um, last um, video that I did, basically I'm, I started working through all the sections of the mental status exam and kind of fleshing it out a little bit more, kind of real world information. Um, this time we're hitting the last three topics, so it's like um, cognition, insight, judgment, but cognition is a huge topic, so that's 90% of this lecture, realistically. Cognition, I'm going to use this definition. It's the mental act or process of acquiring knowledge along with understanding thoughts, experiences, and sensory information. It's kind of as large scale as that is. So what, why is cognitive testing important in psychiatry? So it helps you understand what neuropsychiatric testing is doing by psychologists because um, this they're just doing the more detailed, more accurate in a, a more like um, it's more valid and accurate when they're in a stable environment um, being tested um, versus when we're showing up and the person's like depressed and psychotic or whatever's going on. They're in a hospital kind of thing. Um, it helps build your Swiss Army knife of tools for patient diagnosis and treatment. So you don't always need every tool in the Swiss Army knife, but when you do, you do. So you're a specialist doctor. This is one of those tools you need. Um, so kind of areas that we typically could think about using it, um, ADHD, though in all fairness, that's not what we do most of the time. You just, um, in that kind of situation, you talk to them, you get their history, the parents' history, school's history, you start prescribing um, kind of thing. And then now there's like video, there's like ways they can monitor your, your, your focus and attention and, and concentration stuff, doing video, like video games kind of stuff. So um, altered mental status, definitely important, like delirium, dementia, super important. We'll run across it constantly. Neurocognitive disorders generally, IDD, so the patient... Um, you think they're depressed or that's what they're being presented as to you. And then you start talking to them. You're like, you're kind of a concrete thinker. Your processing speed isn't so fast. What was your highest level of education? It's more history. It's like, oh, your IDD. Um, maybe it's normal. Maybe it's not depressed. It's just people are not reading it properly. Why is cognitive testing generally not important in psychiatry? So what are those situations or kind of concepts of when it doesn't really help you, um, so if a patient's able to give you a routine back and forth conversation so you can do your, you know, full psychiatric initial evaluation, um, you can just say their cognitive function is grossly intact. Um, further evaluation generally is not beneficial for your diagnosis or treatment. You know, if you're just dealing with depression, anxiety, um, even schizophrenia and stuff, it's, it's not super helpful all the time. Um, and you're spending that five or ten minutes trying to do your cognitive testing um, on patients uh, on this on if you do it on all patients kind of thing you're taking away from your actual history gathering because you only have so much time i mean it's not infinite and you're taking away from your therapy skills practice with patients which can be super important right um, and building that rapport with them um, the whole therapeutic alliance buzz term you got to do it um, so if you spend too long on one side you get less time on the other um, cognitive testing can lead um, you, the psychiatrist, astray. If like, I'm going to test everybody, I'm just going to go by the, what does it do? What, and I'm going to put lots of weight on that result. And that's, that's going to be, that's the more scientific piece to this. Um, and that can, that can mess you up. So the classic patient is a geriatric patient who's severely depressed and their cognition's really slow. They're giving a paucity of general like responses to everything. And then they get diagnosed as being demented. And then you give them, you know, some escitalopram or quetiapine or whatever. Um, I'll, I'll skip that one, uh, the quetiapine. There's, there's a lot of arguments right now that that's actually a, a good, uh, medication treatment for older folks, but, um, it, it'll get diagnosed wrong, right? So um, if you just do a nuts and bolts, you'll see other fields that aren't specialists. They do that stuff all the time. They're like, I did some check boxes. That's your diagnosis. So there we go. That's 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 what the box is said. It's like, but they didn't ask all the right questions. They didn't look at all the other information. And your job as a specialist to look at all the other information. So it can lead you astray. Cognitive testing of a acutely decompensated psychiatric patient is is I seriously doubt is is valid, much less accurate. So. Um, kind of on that a little bit, problems with like neuropsych testing by psychiatry generally. Um, so that poor validity. So cognitive tests, I don't think they're valid most of the time because they weren't like tested and normed because um, you're not in a testing environment most of the time doing this. There's significant abnormal behavior going on, right? Like they're really, really depressed and they want to kill themselves or something. Um, and I, I doubt they ever did the research on somebody who's like acutely suicidal. We can't even like test our like normal medications from the FDA half the time that way. 
Um, you don't know what their pre-morbid function is if it's like a one-off showing up. So you actually don't even have enough history to be able to know what it means, what you did. Um, patient might have low motivation in that scenario. And you're, I mean, other than just like they're obviously not motivated kind of thing, you're probably not equipped to actually know or how to like tease that out because you're not doing the full formal version. Um, and you know, they're currently at high stress situation or in the hospital or whatever. And so I doubt other than like checking for ICU stuff or like the, um, MMSE or doing something where they're, they have dementia, delirium, something's going on and it's like in a hospital. It probably is never valid when we do it. Um, so there's many things that are commonly tested, um, for, um, cognitive testing and psychiatry. So it's orientation, attention, concentration, memory, and it's different links. Um, if, if you're a concrete versus abstract, um, thinker, executive function, fund of knowledge, honestly, isn't that often. I, I put it here just cause it's, um, it's easy to ask the questions, but, uh, like for you just walking into a patient's room with no, you know, no equipment. Um, not commonly um, done would be like constructional ability, visual spatial ability, processing speed. Um, we don't typically do that. There's people bringing in their little mocha and they're like, here, can you copy this? And yeah, okay, there you go. You got your visual spatial and construction. But um, it, it's more of just learning how to do an MMSE or something or mocha at that point. Not that it's you really know what you're doing or why half the time as a psychiatrist. Um, or it even has any meaning again. So let's start going through them. We'll just start cranking through one at a time. So orientation. So right, it used to be um, oriented to person, place, and time. It's um, A and O times three. And then psychiatry. We're like, it's times four. The situation as well. We're specialists. This is so smart. So we say alert and oriented times four. Typically written like that, just A and O times four. That's, that's fine. I don't even know if it's considered official, but that's what every doctor does. We're lazy. We don't write stuff out. Person. So these, I'm going to just start giving you examples of things you could ask. This is what's done on, you know, other forms and versions when people are doing mental, uh, doing mental status exams and books and stuff over the last hundred years that I found when I was, did the history version of this. So person, what is your name? What kind of work do you do? Name some of your closest family members that people have considered that over time to be good enough for a person. Um, place, where are we? Um, it's like country, state, city, hospital, floor. Um, you can say, where do you live? How far away is that from here? If they drove here, you know, it wasn't an ambulance or something. Um, or they've been here a few days. Um, time, you know, what time of the day is it? This is going to be a running statement for this whole thing when it comes to psychiatry. Any basic answer that seems like it was a reasonable attempt, it's not just wild and bizarre, it's not completely off, just accept it. Um, I know your attendings would tell you otherwise, but most of the situations, it doesn't matter. If you're like on the bottom 15% and of some type of situation and you're trying to treat them for depression and you're like, oh, look, they're not quite normal. It's like, do you really want to give them a $600 test to go to neuropsych eval right now? Just follow up with them an outpatient, see if it's still there. And if there's no concerns at that point, you're fine. But don't like, this could definitely lead you to a bunch of unnecessary testing very easily. Um, neuropsych evals are not free. They're not cheap. And it's like six hours. Uh, four hours it depends on the situation but it depends on how long they can even do the testing so um be reasonable about all this stuff don't like do massive cutoffs here because again it's not valid most of the time um so time you know what's the year season month day of the week any parts of these do a few parts of them um, how long have you been here for your attending do all the parts they're gonna they're gonna want you to but um you know how long have you been here and it's good to learn them all again because you, this is part of your toolkit you just need to know and basically, it's as soon as you get normal answers, you move on. And if you're getting weird answers, you push a little harder, you know. Um, that's that's like the story of psychiatry, you know, right? It's like, do you want to kill yourself? And they say, um, yeah. And you'll go, okay, good, check, move on. You know, no, no, no. If it's relevant, then you start digging in deeper. Situation. So, yeah, person, place, time, situation, right? The number four. Um, you're just like, who am I? Do they realize you're even a doctor or psychiatrist if you introduced yourself as being a psychiatrist when you showed up? What's the purpose of our talking? All right, what am I doing here? Why are you here? You know, that kind of stuff. Do they understand the basic situation? What's going on? Um, all right, so we'll go to the next one, attention. So attention is the ability to register sensory input, sensory input, whatever it is. It's auditory, visual, somatic. It depends on what you're testing, right? Um, and we never test them all. So again, just realize that. And because you're not testing if they can feel stuff, right? Um, 
and then to okay you could do it on your neuro your psych um your your you could be doing it when you're doing your physical exam if you're doing um, your neurology segment but not not for this so it's your um, attention is your ability to register sensory input and then to direct the cognitive processes towards it it is affected by processing speed so you have to register something happened you don't just get like punched and then you just keep walking on i mean you get punched and then you're like oh something happened ow you know you, know, like you start to react you recognize something happened um, concentration is the ability to sustain that attention so you kind of go from registering to having attention focused to it and then maintaining sustaining that attention on that task for some period of time so you know we're not going to have these like perfect little cutoffs and what it means. If you're concentrating for 10 seconds, 30 seconds, five minutes, you know, at some point everybody fades off in concentration because we can't focus on something for 50 minutes in a class. Um, attention plus concentration can be taken together to mean the ability to focus, sustain, and appropriately shift uh, mental attention as needed. Um, Attention usually is not specifically like tested. Um, if they're having a back and forth conversation with you and you do your neuropsych eval, attention good, concentration good, you're done. Um, for concentration, you could you can test it. There's lots of ways to do it. So it's it's just being asked to do anything that requires them to stay on task for at least a solid minute, right? Um, it's likely to be good enough. I mean, some of these things are 30 seconds. They're not even a minute. Um, but so. Um, Pretty much every time you're testing concentration, you're doing attention plus concentration. And most of the tests, like basically all tests that you do and for, for cognitive testing, you already are getting attention and concentration. Because if if you can't register what's going on, if you don't have if you can't pay attention, like literally, like with altered mental status, not ADHD kid, and if you can't focus on what you were just told to do for 30 seconds, you can't do the rest of the cognitive testing. It's just it all messes up. Other um so um and by default, on pretty much any of these, you could say that if you're testing it, you're doing working memory, which we'll talk about that a little bit later. It's just your ability to manipulate information in short-term memory. You can at least like stay on task for 10 seconds. Um, so here's that's kind of what I said, and I'll say it a little bit better now. So like here's an example. A patient must register a sensory input, like sound, like you've said something. Um, and then they have to hold it in their working memory. So it's some kind of theor theoretical construct. You're asking them to do something or remember something. So it could be like... Um, they've got to remember as, a, as, a, as the instructions, I hit my finger on the table every time I hear the level, the letter A. You know, they, they, have to, they have to actually have that in their working memory. And then they must keep that in their, in their memory so they can do the task. So they're already into short-term memory. And then um, they have to maintain their attention on what's going on and concentrate. So you pretty much get all of those every time you're doing anything. So it... I. You could you could I you could write like with each test oh it technically test does this 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 but you'll it doesn't make any sense at that point because you'll see a string of words every time and they're all technically correct but when you're doing that test you're testing for one thing or two things you're not you don't need to think about it as being all the things it's really there's three or four things you never test for because they're just automatically there and if they're not you're not doing any other testing and you're just focusing on that and you're like this person cannot maintain attention or concentration at all because they have a urinary tract infection with sepsis and they're 95 and congestive heart failure right like um it's it's, it's delirium um so if you're testing attention and reversal, here's several options. They're all legitimate. They're all the same. Um, it doesn't matter what you do as far as the specific pieces. Anything you do in cognitive testing, you just don't want patterns and stuff because you don't or like some kind of like folklore knowledge where they're like you're 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 giving them something. It's like remember, try to remember these words. Mary had a little lamb. Like well, everybody's gonna remember that. That doesn't even help because you don't know what you're testing anymore. It's just more of like um, as soon as they say Mary had and like oh they just start saying it you know. And it's, it's not because they processed or did anything that, that you asked them to do. Um, so order reversal is a good one for concentration when you're trying to test it. So you just have a patient spell a, basically, I would say, a five-letter word, four words, because you got to know they can spell it. If they can't spell it, that doesn't help. You know, like you tell them to spell island, which is in five letters, and they miss an S, and they made it five letters. And they're like, oh, okay, I-L-A-N-D. Nice, I got it right. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. I made that up for the fly. Probably not a good idea. Um, and 
so just spell a word forwards and then and then you have them actually do it backwards and that's the testing so um, commonly used ones are table world earth those are fine you have them spell it they try to do it backwards using their own name is legitimate um, it's longer than five it can be a lot of times but that's fine that's fine i would say if it's four letters or less don't do it but um, if it's seven or eight letters it's such a well-known thing to them they can they should be able to do it um, if they're like Elizabeth or something, don't be a jerk. <laughs> Just pick Earth or something. Um, so flipping words is totally fine for concentration. You can do it days of the week, right? It's like, um, it's like um, can you tell me the days of the week? Blah, they say them. They're like, okay, do it backwards. And, same, and they do the same thing with months of the year. And you just stop them right after four, five or something. Or just let them do the whole thing. But um, months of the year, I'd probably just do about five and I'd stop them um because they can make it there they can make it the rest of the way responding to letters um so you can do it to where they have to um they have to do something as a response to what you're saying so um, responding to letters is um, one of the examples so you say i'm going to say 10 letters whenever you hear the letter a um, i want you to tap on the desk right boom um, do you have any questions um, about those instructions or whatever um, and then you go so when you're actually doing it, you should say a letter and then you wait three seconds. So 10 letters takes a half minute, right? Because you're trying to test concentration, not how fast they can respond. So the common ones used are save a heart um, and it's a, they double up on the heart, on the heart, they have two A's there. It, no E's, I know. But um, Casablanca, the old movie kind of thing. A bad, bad day, but it, bad day, the second one's spelled weird. It's because they all have 10 letters. They all have um, you know enough A's that you can kind of test it. Um, and that's fine. And they just tap each time. You can do it with numbers. So um, the other one's just easier to remember. So that's probably why I would, you would just do it. You, I can remember Casablanca and you start going through or, or um, save a heart. Um, it's hard to do a number thing. You have to write it down because you're not going to know it. Um, but you can say, I'm going to say 10 numbers. Every time I say the number one, you tap. It's exact same. There's no difference. So and then you just, you just don't want a pattern. You could, you could literally say 10 of any numbers if you just think you're not saying a pattern. And then that would be fine. Um, you could use a, um, a yeah. I don't want. To, I want to give you options, but um, it just doesn't doesn't have a pattern. Um, sentence writing. So this is completely legitimate for concentration. It's been used a lot. So um, you just have them write a long, complex sentence that you're telling them. Right. Piece of. But now you need a piece of paper and a pencil. So you've already like overwhelmed psychiatry's ability and consults. <laughs> we're like, uh, where's the paper from your you know bathroom? We tear that. Let's let's try to scribble on it. Like, and it gets ridiculous. But, um, you know, so just any sentence, I made up one here, so it's, you can be like, he drove to the store in a van to pick up gummy bears that he wanted to give his child that afternoon at the basketball game, right? They just have to focus and keep doing it. And that's considered concentration, that's fine. And you have to say it slow enough that they can write. Um, this is just something maybe a little more of, of just trying to be interesting than anything else. Um, I'm, you're not gonna be able to do this a lot of times, um, but it'll show up when you're seeing your neuropsych folks from psychology talking to you. Uh, during your residencies or mental or like maybe medical school or something so there's like a stroop test um it was from um mr johnny stroop it's probably john stroop i don't know um, 1945 it was a phd thesis he did he was just studying interference in um serial verbal reactions using incongruence of word and color so we'll make that make more sense in just a second so Here's the big test, right? Just to give you an example of, of, of what you're about to be in for. So I want as fast as you can. Like, you know, I can't hear you. That's fine. Just just yell it out loud immediately. As soon as you see it, don't read it. Just, just say it. Like, just try to process and say it. I want you to tell me the color of the word on the next slide. The color of the word. Three, two, one, boom. That's good. Yep. So you all said blue. And if you didn't, you're a liar. Um, and if you do the real test, I mean, even if you get it right, a lot of times you'll quickly see how difficult the test gets and your processing speed will come into play because this is concentration and processing speed. Um, you're, you're smart. You did wonderful. You're a beautiful human being. I got that. But um, you can't do this test like just as fast as you can read. Um, it doesn't work that way. So the patient's asked to state the color, not the written word. So here's on the um, right side of the screen. There's a box here. And it's got a lot of words in it. Let me make sure I'm a time mess. Okay. And um, it will show you things that they would just be reading in order on the screen as fast as they can. 
Um, word recognition is faster and it's more influential in the brain, like stronger pathways or, you know, it'll get there quicker to result. And so words are stronger in the brain than color. Um, so that's why they're asking you to do the thing that's harder. So they're asking you to tell me the color because that's you, the first thing you're going to try to say is wrong. You know it's wrong. You have to concentrate on that. And then you're going to um, have a little bit of processing time to override that, that incongruence that he was talking about, the interference and incongruence. Um, so it's kind of just using selective attention because there's more than one aspect to what you're looking at. It has more than one um, property. Sit up a little bit. My bottom's a little uncomfortable there. Um, so it's like you're, um, a selective attention that you're trying to use. You're trying to concentrate. It, this is executive functioning all over the place because it, it, um, when we get to those slides later, it's just not the one you'll ever do. Um, and... Um, so processing speed is evaluated by comparing, comparing your response time to standardized response times because the test has been done so many times and lots of people and they have normal response times by a bunch of variables for um, your demographics. Um, so processing speed is the response time versus the average response time. So if you're slower, you have a slow processing speed. If it's faster, you'd have a fast processing speed for that particular uh, test. Uh, selective attention is just the ability to provide a proper response um, in a more complex situation like this where you have two things you're, you're evaluating simultaneously. Um, executive function, you can just say it's the ability to do this task. That's good enough. Um, all right, so let's go into memory. So um, there are divisions by time of what um, of categories of memory. So we have like immediate, short-term, intermediate, long-term kind of stuff arbitrary don't think that this is like written in stone or it's a different thing in the brain or any of that stuff it's you know it might be and you can have those arguments and especially for long term or short term type of stuff but um but it's it's just categories of length of time to the information that you're retaining right so we think of um, immediate recall as being basically the same thing as registering what you've just seen so it's just a few seconds like You've seen the word brown, and that's what you or your brain is able to focus on for a few seconds. It just registers it. But if you're seeing other stuff and you're not really concentrating or paying attention to it, you quickly lose that information, right? That's, that's one of those things they like to make fun of and doing like illusions and whatever types of things or tricks with, with um, like magicians and stuff. There's short-term memory, which is you've registered it and stuff, but now you're, you're holding on to it for up to a few hours. So you pretty much anything you're doing in the same day with a patient, it's, it's just short term memory, um, unless you're coming back, like going in the morning, coming back in the afternoon. Intermediate memory would be after a few hours. You're like, well, what's a few hours? That's why this doesn't matter. It, it's two hours. It's five hours. I don't know. It, it doesn't matter to a few days. Um, so, and that's where this gets annoying. And that's why the whole mental status staff are doing most of these things. A lot of this, like these parts are just research tools that have been done over time. And some of them have been found to be useful over time. Um, this memory stuff was done a hundred years ago. So, I mean, it has so much baggage with history. I don't, I don't always know, you know, what its real utility is in a lot of situations. Um, it, that's an argument for later. I'll do controversy stuff at some point and maybe in the future. But, um, so you have immediate memory, so it's within seconds. That's, that's, that's your like, um, recall, just like, did you even acknowledge that that happened? Did you register it? Short-term memory, seconds to hours. Then you get to intermediate memory, that's hours to days at this point. And then you get to long-term memory, so days. How many? Two, five, ten? Again, don't know. And then, um, then that's for years, for your life or whatever. Um, most don't do this, but I think it's, you know, this is completely like a, nor a realistic way to look at this information um, from some psychology folks and, you know, some things that have been done for the mental status exam previously. Um, you could say long-term memory has two versions. So you could say there's semantic memory. So that's a memories of, that are taught by others. Um, so that's things that you learn because they're specifically taught by others. Um, and there's episodic memory, uh, terrible name, horrible naming, but which is your actual lived, experienced, autobiographical memory. Like, you know, um, I am six feet tall. I have played basketball. I blah, 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 right? Like, um, that's like your lived experiences, your autobiography. Those are, those are episodic memories. Um, 
there's no real quick on this semantic versus episodic memory there's not actually like a that i know of like solid neurology difference or anything in the brain it's just it's just a category just categories just call it long-term memory move on um, but it's good to be exposed to stuff. So commonly confused ideas, short-term memory versus working memory. I might have already explained this. I did the beginning of this recording like three times already. Um, so what's the difference? Short-term memory, working memory. Are they the same thing? Or are they different? What's the difference? So some consider the overlap so significant they're the same thing. Um, the brain is not little specialized locations of stuff. That's an old bad idea of the brain. It's, it's networks that keep changing. It's much more complicated than just being a place and a thing. Um, so you could just say it's semantics and move on and just like, you know, one day if we know enough neurology, maybe we'll have an answer. But right now it's completely semantics. A way that some people want to separate the two so that they can say that they're different terms is you can say that the temporary storage, the, the actual storage of the information, that's short-term memory. The ability to use that information, manipulate it, that's working memory. So if I say apple table penny and you go apple table penny, short-term memory, right? It's just saying it. If I say apple table penny, which one was a fruit? Working memory. You've had to do something with it. Hopefully that helps. I don't know. Um, all right. So immediate recall, that registering, the thing of a few seconds. If a patient's having an adequate conversation to get with you, they can talk, you can do an interview, it's fine. It's done. Don't test it. There's nothing to do because they've responded to you. Um, you could try doing stuff like an auditory memory span and things to, to test it. Um, it's just, it's really not necessary. If a person can't register information, they like their attention, everything else is already all, all messed up and you're probably dealing with, dealing with like a delirious person or brain trauma. Um, but you want to test it and then sure, let's do it. So, um, which, you know, because you have a brain trauma patient, right? That's the time to do it. Um, and so you don't look like such a, like a crazy person when you go to like... Um, um, we're talking neurology or something, and you're not like, oh, I'm embarrassed. I'm, I'm afraid and embarrassed because you're another specialty. So this is stuff you should know for that point. So um, you're going to do immediate recall. This is you could say this is almost short term memory, but not really. It should be really fast. It shouldn't take 30 seconds. It shouldn't be short term memory. So um, you can do an auditory, so your hearing memory span going forwards with numbers or information. So you say a series of number with one second in between each because this is short. And then the patient repeats. You basically, you just start with four digits. Um, or you can, you, could, you can make sure they understand. Like you go, I'm going to say three numbers. I'm going to say some numbers. Um, and I want you to repeat them back to me after I finish saying them. One, two, three. Your turn. And then you say, okay, good. Any questions? And then you start. Start with four numbers. So here's like examples. Again, all that matters is they're not in a, um, a series or pattern, something that they're going to know. You can't go two, four, six, eight, because then they're, they're just going to know the answers. And it's not because they remember. Um, so you should give them at least two trials. That just means if they mess up once, you, you give them another one with the same number of things. So if they did um, the first one right, and you said three, one, eight, seven, and they said three, one, eight, seven, and then you do eight, four, nine, three, two, and then they messed it up, you can say it again to them. That's fine. Um, I would say, though, that when you're repeating, you really you have to use a different set of numbers. Um, you could just pick another one of these and uh, type thing and just pick the last one and say nine, six, eight, two or, or whatever. Um, if they get like a, a normal response is most people can get to five digits if given at least um, one failure, right? So they get or two failures type thing. Um, they get two trials. So one failure. Um, and that's fine. They, in all honesty, as soon as you hit five, just stop and move on. It's, you're probably not valid what you're doing anyway. So don't like if they can do five, you're good. They're, they're actually able to have immediate recall that's very functional and average with other people. But again, even average means average. So if that's five, that means a lot of people got four, right? You know, so what do you, what does it really mean to you? I don't know. I don't know. If they can't do four, it's probably a little weird, um, especially with a few tries. There, you know, there might be IDD or brain damage or, or just something else going on. But it's, a, it's, it's something significant. So you can do auditory memory. Um, it can auditory memory span backwards for immediate recall. Again, this is immediate recall because you're saying it. They just say it back. There's not a time delay of any significance. 
So this takes a lot more working memory and concentration than the other. It's easier just to say things forward than to have to reverse it. So um, if five going forwards was normal, four is backwards because it's a lot harder. So you start with, I'm going to say two numbers to them, right? You go two, five, and I'll say them backwards, five, two, good to go. And then you can go six, one, nine. And, and give, again, give them at least one or two tries. Um, and if they get to four digits, that's fine. A lot of people, that means if four is average, some people got three. Um, that's fine. That's fine. There's a broad range of intelligence and situation nervousness and all the other things that mess it up. Short-term memory, seconds to hours. Um, most people can hold five to nine pieces of information, depending on what kind of information, um, in their short-term memory. And that means they like practicing stuff. It doesn't mean you just give it to them once and then they just can mag magically remember nine things later and, and you just, they didn't do any tricks or anything to help themselves remember. Most people, reasonable chances to do whatever they want can get somewhere between five and nine. And some information we're better at, right? Like we're good at phone numbers and stuff, or um, we used to be, not anymore. Older people will be because they know that there's you know, going to be three digits, four digits kind of thing. And so they can chunk it and remember it, especially if it's any kind of pattern or something that they recognize. Um, and if you're doing short-term memory, I mean... The actual testing and the way you do cognitive testing, it can literally be anything, any type of information they can do. And maybe they're all slightly different. I don't know. So it could be sounds. It could be shapes. I mean, it could be triangle, square, square, circle, you know, like that's legitimate. It could be pictures. What did you see? Hammer, airplane, you know, tree. That's legitimate. It could be smells. Nobody's going to do it, but I don't know. You could probably pick three or four smells people can identify like lemon. Um, it could be numbers that they're seeing, um, you know, that kind of stuff. So you can test anything. And, and they should be able to get five to nine pieces right um, in, if you ask them again two or three minutes later. Um, and it's a short term. I think you should, like always, it says one to two minutes here. Um, I would be really hesitant under two minutes to, to call that that. Um, Again, there's no real like hard borders, but give them at least two minutes. Just say Dr. Mellon told me to do that. Um, and you need to ensure registration first. So you can't just be like, the numbers are R27490. And then you just start talking for a while and you come back, where are the numbers? And they're like, oh, I didn't, I never even learned them. Like they got, they got to say it back to you and actually show that they registered it. Cause it's, yeah, like it, otherwise you don't know. It's like, I want you to spell falafel and backwards and they can't even spell it forwards. It doesn't help, right? It's that kind of thing. So they have to register it. Um, for simplicity, oh, that doesn't matter. We already talked about that. Okay, verbal memory. So these are ways to do short-term um, short memory. So three-word recall, apple, table, penny. Um, please repeat these three words, apple, table, penny. I'm going to ask you them again in, in five minutes and then you're totally wrong. You ask it again at three or whatever. Um, so when they actually ask him, say, what were those words I asked you earlier to, um, to remember? Um, they can, um, they try to give them. And then um, if they don't get it, you give them a hint. So it's whatever the hint is. Just it, it's, There's not like official ones that matter. But if it's apple, that's a fruit table. You can say it's a piece of furniture in a house or whatever you want to say. Um, and a penny, it's a coin that nobody uses anymore. Um, and then you write down the words that they use, the number correct, hence given. So, you know, it's kind of like a, a way to write this would be like short-term memory, apple, table, penny, two of three, did not get apple, required hint, furniture for a table. So you told them what they didn't get and they needed a hint, that kind of thing. Um, so I looked at this a little bit. I was just curious. Um, everything I say, take with a, you know, grain of salt. It's mostly true. Psychiatry with Dr. Mellon. So, um, let's see. So, apple, table, penny. I was like, where did this thing come from? Why does everybody say this? And this is, this is like the problem I have with our field generally. We act like things are more real than they are all the time or more official and, not, and correct and all this kind of stuff. So, I, I think it's basically from Fulstein's um, 1975 Mini Mental Status Exam. There's like a question, you know, it's like number seven. It says, I'm going to name three objects. After I have said them, I want you to repeat them back to me. Remember what they are because I will ask you, um, to, I will ask you to name them again in a few minutes. Apple, table, penny. All right. So... The mini mental status test is for dementia and estimates severity of, prog um, of progression over time. Um, and are you testing for dementia right now? Is your patient calm and collected, not in the depths of a serious psychiatric illness? No. 
then your patient's not part of their like original patient population kind of concept and how the test gets used over the decades and tested and researched on. Um, so it's too influential. This like these three words, and um, so every textbook and attending uses them like the, like the official three words. It could be anything, right? It doesn't matter. Pumpkin log unicorn. That's totally legitimate, right? Um, you could say a Halloween. Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's a t- um, dead plant. I don't know, and, and it's a magical animal. Something. It's like it doesn't matter. Use whatever you want. Uh, make sure they're not in a category. They're not related. Don't go like, uh, it's a blue jay flying, right? <laughs> like well, one of them's a verb. Don't do that. Just use, use nouns. But, but yeah, don't pick things that they're they're again going to just clump together, and it's it's not it's not good for testing their actual um, short term memory. So those are verbal memory things you could do, right? Um, auditory memory. So that's like tap counting. Um, I've never seen a person do this, but I'm going to do it in the future. Um, the patient counts the number of taps you perform out of their sight. So it's under the table, right? Um, or something. So they can't see. You tell them to close their eyes. That helps. Whatever. Um, and you could snap or something. But um, the patient counts the number of taps you perform over a 30 to 45 second window. So And you should leave, um, you should do at three to 15 kind of taps over that time frame and always keep like a three second gap between them or something. So there's a little bit of time. So, um, not three seconds, probably like one to two, sorry. Um, at the minimum, don't go like where they're trying to space out the, the actual, like, was that two? Was that one kind of thing? Um, it should be somewhere three to 15 range. Do it like three times. You do the testing for two minutes and you're good to go. And then you're like, okay, that's your short term memory. You get the beatbox on the table for a little bit. Um, so it's auditory memory. Story memory is another way to do it. Um, so this is where you just read a paragraph, um, long story, um, with that quote, notable phrases is, is parts to it. Um, and the patient then tells you as much of the story back as they can. And it doesn't have to be in the right order or anything else. It doesn't matter. Anything reasonably close to anything said is completely fine. So very commonly, there's, um, there was a few done that had 15 notable phrases, and if you get around eight, you're doing great. So it'd be like, Jerome is a television news reporter. He covered an earthquake that happened in Los Angeles. He interviewed an old man, blah, 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 right? And getting eight of those, like it had a car volcano los angeles whatever like you know and you wouldn't call them volcano because it's a little too far it's supposed to be an earthquake um i would be nice i'd probably count it i don't care but other people would um but as many pieces as you think they just reasonably got close to it um because you're asking them to repeat a story to you it's like not everybody's gonna be perfect to that but around eight pretty normal there's been longer versions there's this one i can't use it it's like copyright everything's copyright about everything but um it's like the cowboy story and it was 32 phrases so it's like a bigger chunkier paragraph and they'd be like well 20 is normal so you see it's just lots of details can they get about half that's good enough um so intermediate testing. So this is your hours to days testing, um, and it's kind of hard to test in psychiatry most of the time. You have to you have to ask types of questions you could actually know is factually true, and that's not always easy to do. Um, so how you could do that is like, how did you get here today? If they came in an ambulance a few hours earlier, drove in a car, and they could tell you the right answer. I mean, you know, that's that means something as long as you know from the ER note or you know the ER doc. Um, what was the weather like yesterday? If there was, if it was raining or something different than normal from where you were at. Um, don't, um, what did they serve you for whatever food meal, um, you know, on the unit before, if you looked at the food meal so you could see what they had or something, then that would be legitimate. Um, what was yesterday's group session about or their group therapy? Now, if you know the topic or something about it, then that would, that would give you a way to know their intermediate term, intermediate term memory is, is doing okay. Long term, so now we're like the days to years. Long term memory typically um, takes um, verification from another source, right? Like your, how would you know the real answer to it? It's their life. Um, so um, again, I'm going to do this in the semantic um, kind of um, memory breakdown with the episodic, but um, so. So semantic memory would be things that other people have taught um, have, have taught you. 
And um, so things that you could test is a way of long-term memory. You could break it down and then you test it because you know if they know it or not. You basically just pick the easiest things you can think of. That's the only goal. Like where you're like 99% sure most people could answer this. And you got to get more than one thing to try to answer. So that if they're the 1%, you're not just like, oh, you're all messed up. You're crazy. We're drugging you. Brain scan, right? Like that's. Um, so, you know, who was the first president in America? That, that anybody born here probably can answer that. Um, um, you know, what country did the U.S. fight uh, against for its independence in 1776 with, you know, with George Washington, that kind of thing? Um, who is the current president or last president? I'll give them either because it'd be surprised how many people mess that up. So it's like, who's the current one or last one? Especially if it's split between the parties where you have one party one time like Republican and a Democrat another, then it's like good, they have a good chance of getting one right. If it, um, um, You could say like, name planets in our solar system. Name me vegetables. Name insects. You know, just anything. And what temperature does water freeze? Something like that. Um, don't do anything hard. Try to ask a question you think a first grader could get some answers right. Um, episodic memory, this is autobiographical stuff, so you need somebody else's information to help you get it right. But in a normal back and forth, in a normal situation, they're telling their family history and doing all this stuff, they're perfect, right? They're giving you all their long-term memory um, history. for the, That's what all the history is that you're doing, pretty much. Um, you know, But easy things would be like jobs they've had, schools they've attended, their medical history, that kind of stuff. Um, being very lax on the medical history. Don't be like, oh, you didn't tell me you had diabetes type 2. And it's like, I told you I had sugar problems. Okay, good enough. You're the doctor, not me. Um, but it's your life. You're supposed to know it all. How do you not know what medicines you put in your body? Yeah, it's like all the silliness that doctors get all caught up on. It's like not real life. Um, concrete versus abstract thinking. I'm gonna go. I had some water. Let me get some more. This is a long, long speech. Okay. Hope you're all doing well. And this, this is somewhat helpful. Um, so concrete versus abstract thinking. So young children are concrete thinkers. Um, the most, like, I think the most proper way to think about that versus being weird about concrete versus abstract is, especially when you're young, they're the best example of this. And it's due to understanding a language and everything else, right? Um, being a concrete thinker means that words are taken literally. You're not using context or layers to the stuff. It's just this thing means this. And if it's a real, like, if it's an idea that's kind of broad or something or it's not comparable to everyday life, things you experience, it's hard. Death is not going to make a lot of sense or, you know, lots of things like that are not going to make sense if you're real young because you're like, they went to sleep, right? They're using something that they, they can understand. The tree went the, the tree went to sleep, you know, or whatever. It's like, no, it's, it's dead. It's a log. Um it to an extent right you can teach you can teach abstract thoughts if you really work or particular concepts even people that are young but around age eight or nine you know boys girls maybe slight difference different kids are just different on when when they become more just firmly in an abstract area versus they're still transitioning um so somewhere around eight to nine they're understanding double meanings they can think about thinking a little bit more they hypothesize and make interpretations it doesn't mean that you won't run into a 13 year old who still does random things that are completely concrete you're like whoa you just really said that like that's normal i just it takes a very long time before we're fully abstract and we just catch all the social cues of our culture and everything else going on um so um, it, the normal flow of conversation is usually good enough. You just say that you can tell if they're a concrete thinker or not. Um, you know, if you're like, say, hey, what brought you to the hospital? And then they say, ambulance. And then they don't say anything else, right? You get all these like real chopped, direct things. Then, you know, you're thinking IDD, autism, what the heck's going on? Are they playing with me? That's, you know, but that's also would be obvious during the conversation because they'll do things that are abstract. Um, so... Once you understand what concrete thinking is, we go through this and you see patients, it's, it's super obvious almost all the time. Remember, delirious dementia patients will try to play dumb with you. So um, these are um, people that when you're doing actual cognitive testing a lot, like um, delirium patients um, and dementia patients, they're going to try to play dumb. They're going to make up excuses. I don't know that. That's hard. I was always bad at math. They're like just excuses are coming all over the place. So they'll start joking about it and try not to answer all these kind of things. You don't let them, you just keep going. It's kind of like, 
it's just the stuff you got to do in psychiatry. You know, I'll, I'll go back to the killing yourself. Like, um, um, if you had thoughts of suicide, yeah, okay. Um, have you ever acted on it? Um, have you ever tried it? Attempted? Have you done self harm? When's the last time? You know, blah. You have to you start plowing in over. You don't just leave it there. Like, and so it's the same thing. It's like you're trying to figure out if they can do abstract thinking. Can they focus and concentrate and executive function? And you're concerned about it, so you keep asking and you and you push them right. And um, you, yeah. And so the dementia, delirium patients, particularly in this area, will fight back a lot. Um, and don't get pushed off. That's like a medical student, first year, you know, psychiatry resident mistake. Abstract thinking is usually chest tested with either similarities or proverbs. That's the ones everybody likes to use. Um, okay, we'll talk about them, and then I'll I might give additional input similarities testing so this is done to test the patient's ability to give an abstract reason why two objects are similar right this is on mocha we're all like oh i know this one and and similarities so um so in typical like a good question format to do this you should say in what way are blank and blank the same or similar the way people mess this up when they're when they're when they're delirium and alt, altered mental status and stuff. For some reason, they tell you how they're different, <laughs> so you got to keep pushing. You say, "Okay, I understand. That's that's how they're different." But how are they? Um, what makes them more alike than different? Or you know that kind of thing. Um, if they're not giving you adequate answers, you can say, "Please tell me more about that." Or what type or class of things do they belong to? Like a category, so that you know you can see how they're similar. Um, because similarities, you can almost just say are categories. That's that's really all you're looking for, and you should do a comprehension check on it. anything that's kind of hard like this, or you have to you have to give more than like two words of ex- explanation. You should give an example and see if they could do it. So um, give them one or two easy ones, like how are an apple and a banana similar? They're fruit or whatever. And oh, they're at a grocery store. Okay, well, um, in what way? <laughs> you know, you start pushing in again, um, or tell please tell me more about that. That kind of thing. Um, how are a monkey and a dog similar? Animals, mammals, whatever. Again, never get caught up on if it's the right category answer. I mean, this is not an if it, if you gave them a you know grade school A B C D testing, sure, but they don't have that, and it's not fair to be like, oh, uh, 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 they said mammals, they're animals. That's that's dumb. Don't don't be that way. Um, and if they can't answer that, you know, an apple and a banana are fruit, and they're like, uh, but one's different one's yellow one's red and they just just you're done like if you can't get past those they they can't do it they're abstract you you really start asking other questions keep changing what it is of what you're asking and different um don't just i would if if similarities fail that early i would actually flip over to the next one um after that which um will be the um the proverb testing so um let's see yeah so I wrote down a list of examples that have been used in different ways and different things just to give you an idea. So it could be like a, um, a barn and a house. I said a bar and a house because that's what they did here, but any two buildings. A bird and a butterfly, a car and a bus, a duck, a chicken, guitar, piano. You can look at this and get ideas. Anything works. Don't ever get caught up in, well, that's what this one test has. That must be the right answer. Um, you can have fun with all these things and come up with your own special list you memorize because that's all it is. You got to do it over and over the same one. If you change every time, you'll, confu- you'll confuse yourself to no end of, and won't know what to say. But, um, you know, it, it's fine. Proverb testing. This is super hard. Um, most people, I don't think, can do this properly, but this is the other one that's done. So proverbs are, saying, are sayings with meanings that are beyond that literal statement. And um, so it it has a it's a statement that's easily understood, like just by the words in order. But it, it is entirely meant to be something else, and it's that's more the cultural relevance and the, the abstract thinking side. So you just say uh, you know tell them you know a proverb is a saying with a broader meaning than its literal statement. An example could be that Rome wasn't built in a day, which literally could mean that it took more than one day to build Rome. But as a proverb, it would mean you should not be rash or impatient. Just think about how hard that second part is to answer properly. I couldn't do a very good job at it. Your patients can't do a good job at it. I mean, um, a bunch of science majors are like, we're horrible at this stuff. Um, but 
you know, like here's a very common one, probably one of the most common in the English language right now for U.S. Like the grass isn't always greener on the other side. We, I think we do a little bit better on this one. Maybe it's a little bit easier to try to get in the ballpark. And that's the whole goal of this thing. If they get in a ballpark, if they give you an abstract reason to take it, you know, if they can sort of give you some stuff, totally fine. You're mostly going to cower patients where they don't want to answer it and they feel weird. But, um, you know, so... Literally, it means that maybe this side's brown or that side's green or, you know, or something like that. But as a proverb, um, it is referring to the idea that people always want something they don't have, like a job, fame, some other per- pa- um, person's situation. It means the other option isn't always better, something like that, right? Um, and then, you know, so you give some, some examples. So I picked some of the easiest ones I could find. Come up with your own. It doesn't, it's all good. Come up with your own. I mean, by go for some very culturally broadly understood common ones. Don't don't do anything weird. Don't literally make up your own. Um, actions speak louder than words, and that's just meaning what you actually do matters more than what you say. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Each person has their own idea concept of what beauty means. Um, don't count your chickens before they hatch. You don't know what you're going to get, right? That's kind of all it means. Live and learn. Life teaches you lessons. It's that kind of thing. Um, So next topic, executive functioning. So um, this topic's a mess. We use it all the time in psychiatry, and we act like we know what we're talking about or what this means. I'm going to give you a okay definition set up of this, and if it looks hard, it's because it's like a research topic. It's really hard to know the right answer. Um, so executive functioning, um, it's a concept that could be defined as the ability to generate goals and plans, right? Like just, you got a goal and you got a plan that, that, that's part of executive functioning or what it could be. Executive functioning is the ability to maintain focus and motivation in order to follow through with those goals and plans, maintain that focus and motivation to follow through with them. It's your flexibility in altering those goals and plans in response to the situational context, right? Um, So what it is not. So this is uh, stuff that you might hear in psychiatry or things of this nature. Um, My statement is this is not, this is what executive functioning is not. They're wrong. They need to do more research. They need to read. They need to not just repeat a textbook and go, but Kaplan and Sadox said or whatever. That's that's not legitimate. Look at neurology. Look at other fields in, in psychology. The people actually doing this work, not what is just historically drugged through in psychiatry. So, executive functioning is not the prefrontal cortex. That's garbage. That's absolutely not true. There's there is no frontal lobe syndrome. You hear that term from time to time. Older, younger psychiatrists, whatever. There is no frontal lobe syndrome. You can get the same executive dysfunctions you have with frontal lobe damage from damage to the basal ganglia, the thalamus, and white matter pathways that are running around. It's not one area. That's, 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 you could, instead of saying it's frontal lobe syndrome, you could say it's basal ganglia syndrome, right? Like, it's wrong. You can't say it that way. It's not correct. Just because, and you're like, well, but they know what I know, and they know, or they know what I mean. No, it's wrong. Don't say weird stuff just because historically that's what we do. Frontal um, lobe damage can occur punched in the head, shot, frontal lobe damage, right? Um, And not have executive um, dysfunction. There's plenty of those case studies and stuff. So it's not like, oh, but, you know, it's not just that it's this area and this area. No, you can damage that area and still not get that problem. Um, Virtually all executive functioning tasks require several sections. If you want to do an executive functioning task, you will be using the prefrontal cortex. You will be doing the basal ganglia. You will be using the cerebellum and the thalamus. And usually additional related cortical areas outside of the prefrontal cortex. So um, like all of them, every time you're doing anything that just is trying to do those basic things up here where we said to generate goals and plans, to be maintain focus and motivation to do those goals and plans and then flexibly alter those goals and plans based on what's going on. So it's 
it's all of the um, anytime you're doing that stuff all those parts of the brains because the brain is not segmented that is a wrong idea that psychiatry still carries through it is not little clumps of stuff it, it, it's it's an interconnected network of, of of pathways that are changing and fluctuating um all right there's the soapbox let's move on executive functioning so how do you actually what are normal ways that we test them we're doing cognitive um, cognition testing so um you can have uh, do speech and fluency with like category naming so you can test executive functioning by simply providing a goal where they're listing an item in a category for a period of time maintaining that goal right it's you're not trying to change it on them they're not flexibly altering you're not trying to do that just speech and fluency with category naming it works great so super easy you don't have to get this is like one you could always do all the time call it good and move on so you'd say name as many nouns as you can that start with the letter f so you specified nouns so they can't say other things and you could say like um you know instead of just nouns as the normal naming game you could say um, um, nouns that are not proper nouns so they don't sit there and go fred fanny you know frank or something on you so um, you say non-proper nouns if you want or whatever. Um, and keep going for 30 seconds until I tell you stop. You could do it with animals, plants, food, bands, movies, whatever. It doesn't matter. Categories. Words starting with a letter. Things you find in a grocery store alphabetically. Start with A is apple. Now continue. Yeah, whatever, whatever. You know, because like if I did the alphabet one, I used to do that a lot when I started out because that's what I was taught. And I would just start stop people around F or G. And there's common ones people are going to mess up every time because the letter is really hard to do in a grocery store because um, there's not enough common objects that start with that letter. Following instructions, completely legitimate executive functioning testing. So you just provide a goal, follow several instructions for a time period, maintain the goal, right? Same thing. So um, this one's no good to me because it requires materials and, we're, you know, we, I don't even walk in with a stethoscope. It's asking me to walk in with a piece of paper is, is, is almost too much for me as a psychiatrist. So you need three pieces of paper, different sizes, and you, and you hand them to the patient and you say, take these for me. Thank you. Now place the largest people, um, piece on the desk, place the middle size piece on your lap, and then give me the smallest piece back and then wait to see if they can do it. You know, that, that's totally fine. That works mazes you could bring a maze with you and say please solve this that's fine that works um trails testing right the famous thing is mocha um i just made my own up because it's it's is not special their version is not like oh but this one was tested in norm yours is invalid and it's the same concept and it doesn't matter if the bubble moves here or here it's it's the same test and it's dumb to think of it otherwise um, so that's basically where they just have some kind of pattern thing. They have to alternate back and forth and how they're doing. So they usually it's numbers, letters. So you go, um, you start at one, you go to, you draw a line to a, you go from a to two and you continue doing this and you can't cross any lines. And then, um, they give them a real easy one. They go, you know, like one, a two B three C and you're like, good, you got it. And then you hand them a bigger one and then they freak out and can't do it. You're like, aha, dementia. No. Um, Read and explain a long paragraph. So I rewrote part of uh, a Brothers Grimm. This is the um, adaptation from like a um, the Fox and the Horse. I don't I have no idea what this story is. I probably should, um, but um, I don't think I've ever read it. So I found it. It's a hundred year old story. It was like Google Books or whatever, and um, I just wrote it and, and changed some words so that they're more normal than nowadays. You read them. Um, you have them. You hand them this piece of paper with this thing, and they read it, and then just put it down and say, "What did you read? Explain it." And they just give you an explanation. If they can do that, executive functioning intact. Um, so this would be like, um, I'll just read like one or two sentences to give you an idea. It's not like hard language or anything. It's like a farmer had a horse that had been an excellent, faithful servant to him. But he was now too old to work for the farmer um, who had given him um, nothing more to eat. Blah, 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 that kind of thing. Oh, actually, I have read this story. I forgot. <laughs> okay, <laughs> never mind. I read this to my kids. Moving on. Um, I wrote these PowerPoints a little while back absurdities testing so this is another reasoning test like similarities that you could do i would um probably um so we have a pretty good list going so far of all these things for executive functioning but this is another way you can test things kind of like similarities um, it's using um, discrepancies or dissimilarities that they need to catch on to to check their reasoning ability so you need to give them an example. They need to show that they even understand what you're asking. Accept anything reasonable. Don't be weird. 
So I just made these up. I read the original kind of ones, and I made up some more because it's it's just, it's along this exact same line. It's there's nothing fancy. A dog fell down while running 215 miles per hour. You know, like um. So what is there anything about that statement that you would you think is absurd? Like, well, the dog, how about it running to over 200 miles an hour, right? A squirrel ran by and quacked at a dog, causing the dog to run up the tree, right? It's that kind of stuff. It's just some, some weird sentence. And um, it just has one, something that's obviously wrong in it, and it's seeing if they can pick it out. So that's executive functioning. Um, so how do you write this stuff, right, in your cognition and note writing? So you can write your interpretations when you're doing this part of the note, when you're doing your MSC. It doesn't have to be separate. Many psychiatrists commonly kind of write it here. So you can put like concentration poor and then put patient unable to spell table backwards. And then you write what they did and you know, write what they did. So E-B-L-A-E-T. That way you, you, so you don't have to further explain, oh, they inverted these letters. They added, a, you know, somebody else can look at it. It doesn't really matter. It's just they couldn't do it. That's what they said. You know what it is, but you don't need to write a paragraph. You're just, this was the task, this was the response, their concentration's poor, good to go. Um, so I wrote, I wrote several, I'll kind of read them to you real quick. So, you know, sensory, um, you, for sensorium and orientation kind of stuff, you say um, alert and oriented times four, or you can say like um, um, alert and oriented to self only, you know, or A and O times one, that kind of stuff. Um, Attention, concentration, you could say reverse spelling, world as, D-L-R-O-W, serial 3, subtraction from 20, 20, 17, 15, 10. They obviously messed that up. And so you could say like poor concentration and write serial, th serial 3 subtraction from 20, 20, 17, 15, 10. And everybody knows they messed up, right? Memory, registration and short-term memory intact. Recalls three of three objects immediately after one minute. I don't feel like you have to even write it down at that what the word is, right? Like it's they got it all right. Who cares? Intermediate memory, impatient, um, breakfast properly reported. So you gave an example of how you know it's an intermediate memory because it's of what they would have to be asked in that situation um, versus the you know famous apple table penny, or you could write apple table penny, whatever, or was it pumpkin log unicorn? I hope some of you do that in the future. Um, I think I might. Um, Long-term memory, semantic memory, names first president. Episodic memory, names high schools attended. You know, it's that kind of thing. Abstract reasoning, identifies a bird and tree as both living. That kind of thing. So that would be, you know, better than most of us, what we really do in real life. Um, if you kind of even wrote roughly like that, that would be that'd be pretty awesome. Um all right, insight and judgment, last two pieces, and we'll have made it through this. You're, you're all doing awesome. Um, I'm glad you can pause this and walk around and eat and, and wait a day and do everything else you need to get through these PowerPoints, but um, I think it's helpful. I hope it is. Um, all right, insight, simple definition, aware of one's own illness or, and or situation. Insight, awareness of one's own illness and or situation. That'd be a pretty simple definition. Um, there's a lot of controversy and insight to me. Um, uh, so I, I'm just gonna be a little bit of a jerk and give a slightly longer version. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I actually have some problems with this concept. A better definition to insight could be like the ability to label atypical mental events, behavior, emotion, experiences as unusual and relevant to the psychiatric profession. Um, Probably a little bit better definition. Um, so the ability to label a typical mental events, whether that's behaviors, emotions, experiences, as unusual and relevant to the psychiatric profession. There's a little bit of my own definition. I kind of ripped a few things apart to get there, but I think that's probably an okay definition of insight for normal use. So insight's more likely adequate. It's more likely good insight. Um, without a mood or a thought disorder, a stable affect is probably going to help you get a better insight. Like it's more likely to be correct or to have good insight and no relevant um, personality disorder traits. Um, it might mess up that part of their insight for the thing that you're trying to find out if they have insight into. Insight is highly subjective. Okay. You're all going to just use insight and judgment to say it's fine, fair, great. It's just like a general impression. There's no thought process there in general impression for all of you all the time. But 
These are just more correct ways to think about this. Insight is highly subjective. You need to consider religious and cultural context. You really would. If you want to know about insight and that situation, you need to know from you need to know somewhat if, from their point of view and their group identity and what's going on. Um, so this is a place where historically psychiatrists would place defense mechanisms um, comments. So insight is where they would put all their Freudian psychodynamic you know kind of stuff in. Um, as, a, as an example, poor medication compliance does not correlate well with poor insight. So I know, you know, you're like, oh, they got, they know that they are suicidally depressed and then they're not taking their meds. They have poor insight. No, it actually doesn't correlate at all. They've actually studied that directly and it's like, it's garbage. It's, it's a poor association. Regular people have a hard time taking their own medication with bad medication compliance. You're not special in psychiatry. Nobody takes their blood pressure medication or diabetes medication well or any of the other stuff. It's not just you. Um, there's generally like a sliding scale terminology used when it comes to um, insight. So people say it's good or fair kind of thing. Um, sometimes they say good to fair or fair to good kind of, um, insight. And that's just you recognize that they, they have a mental disorder. They're taking treatment. They're seeing a psychiatrist. That's great. Poor or you could say limited insight does not recognize mental disorder or believes like delusions are probably true, like they're weird thoughts. Absent insight is when you're just like they're completely convinced they have no mental disorder. So absent insight, um, I know, would, would you know the best example, most common would be somebody with just like obvious severe schizophrenia situation, um, especially not treated and everything else, even if treated. Um, and you know just because you're a drug addict and you have an addiction problem and you. Just, you blow off the psychiatrist and you're, you know, you want to leave and you're trapped up. That doesn't mean you have poor insight. Um, we'll get into those kind of things in the end. But um, it's their absent insight, completely convinced, does not have a mental disorder. There are insight tests. So um, Aaron Beck, uh, Mr. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy with his you know family dynasty and all this stuff. Um, you know, I found studies from like 1970 to 2001 from him where he was looking at mental status exam stuff. And so he did, he was doing insight kind of testing stuff back in 2001 and put a paper out for schizophrenia. So they, they exist. Nobody uses it. Don't, don't worry. There's nothing to look at. Like nobody. I've never seen a person even pretend to look at one um, for a real patient really looking for insight. You can just ask questions if you really want to know, but we we know you just hand wave and you just give an answer. Insight judgment, move on, because it's like a fake fake part of this for most most patients, most situations. Um, but you could say, is there, is there anything um, anything relevant to their psychosis? Right? Like, are the voices real? You know, um, do you think other people can hear the voices? That kind of stuff. Um, did you stop drinking when you found out you had liver damage? That's tricky because, again, you got to take in all their other information and what does it mean to be addiction and is that, how does that correlate with insight? It, gets, it becomes a philosophical argument a little bit. Um, do you believe anything besides benzodiazepines can help your anxiety? You know, um, do you think medical treatment could help your anxiety or depression? Again, you see how loaded these are and subjective. Some people are like, you know, screw your field and their meds and how they mess with my mind. And they're like, oh, you don't realize what you're doing, so you have no insight. I'm always right. I'm right. Um, how do medications help you? What changes would help you the most? Um, what do you think caused your anxiety, panic, confusion? What is your psychiatric diagnosis? What does that mean to you? Um, what kind of place is this? What kind of doctor am I? Where are you? What caused you to be here? That kind of stuff. All right. Judgment. Judgment is the ability to anticipate the consequences of behavior. Not whether you make good choices. The ability to anticipate the consequences of behavior. You're able to recognize the relationship and draw a conclusion from the evidence, right? That's judgment. Doesn't mean you have good judgment or you follow it through. It's, it's to understand that those two things are... that. Um, Con there are consequences to, to a particular action, thought, behavior th setup. Good judgment requires at least adequate insight. Um, cognitive dysfunction that, re that results in um, reduced uh, insight will impair judgment. So like altered mental status, things of like that, like you know, um, that, those situations, delirium. 
complexity affects judgment. It's hard to come up with a proper judgment when it's there's too many variables moving around or you don't know what you don't know kind of thing in that situation. Um, judgment is also subjective in many ways, just like insight. Judgment is not the same as decision or action. I'm going to say that again. Judgment is not, is not the same as decisions that are made or the actions that are done. Judgment precedes decision and action because you don't agree with someone's decision and actions does not mean they have impaired judgment. They just need to understand, we're going to go back, they need to be able to anticipate the consequences. Not make good choices. That's, that's not the same thing. You're not here to see if they make good choices. You're seeing if they are able to make adequate judgments. They could want to make an end of life decision right now that you don't agree with because you think there's a, they'd get a blood product and they'd be fine, but it's strongly against their religion and they say no. And so they die. Their judgment was intact. If you ask them, you know, um, this, this is, I'll be a part of another lecture, right? But if say, do you understand that as an adult, right? Um, that if you don't take this blood product after you've just been in this car wreck, that um, without it, there's a good chance you're going to die. With the, with the blood product, you're very likely to live. Yes. Will you take the um, blood product? No. Their judgment is intact. And um, so that's, that's like, is a way to think about that. Maybe that helps. I don't know. Um, that sounded serious, did it? Um, judgment is not related to outcomes, right? The action, decision, outcomes kind of thing. So here's, these are trivial examples. I just made them up, whatever. Bad judgment, bad outcome. So you, you made a bad judgment and you got a bad outcome. I took drugs because I got bored and I ended up in jail. Okay, that was not, that was not a good judgment and that was a bad outcome for that. Not good. Um, you could say bad judgment, good outcome. You know, you could just flip this one and say, I took drugs because I got bored, had a great time. Okay, right, that would, that would be not a bad outcome. So um, another way you could have bad judgment or good outcome could be um, psychotic, unmedicated patient with schizophrenia. You know, so they have poor judgment and they've got a starting point. They don't know what's going on or why. They go to the ER because they want a cigarette and they get help. <laughs> you know, and like, that would count. That would count because they had a good outcome, but they went, they went to the ER to get a cigarette. That was weird, bad judgment. Um, so you could say you could have good judgment and still get a bad outcome, right? You know, just because um, you could be a college student who knows they should should study. They understand they should study. Uh, but they go out and party all night um, and they do terrible, right? So they, they knew it was a bad idea and they did it anyways. Um, so they had, they had good judgment, bad outcome because they didn't, they didn't, they didn't um, follow through. Wait, that didn't even quite sound right. I might have messed that up. Sorry, guys. Um, yeah, maybe that is a bad example now that I'm thinking about it. I don't think I can do this on the fly. Um, good judgment is I don't want to... Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to mess it up. Sorry, that's actually not that's not a correct example. Um, just Let's just say there, there there's plenty of situations where you could... You try to do the right thing and it still turns out bad. We'll, we'll leave it as that. Um, I'm not going to be able to think of that on the fly. Um, good, um, good judgment, good outcome. So um, it's rare. It doesn't, so this stuff is kind of trivial. That's actually why I'm pointing this out. And then the fact that I can't do it, I apologize. Um, so good judgment, good outcome. That's what we all want. So I have chest pain and dizziness, and I was always fine. And I was, and, and it's like um, I'm getting like it hurts really bad, and I can't feel my right arm, and I've got pain in my neck or whatever. You go directly to the ER, and they see that you're having a heart attack. Good, good, good. You did all the right stuff. Um, so you definitely need to consider religious and cultural context when you're doing judgment, just like insight. Um, consider the overall significance or importance of the judgment because. Um, you know, it might be trivial and doesn't matter and they can say no because they could just say no. They don't care. It doesn't matter to them. Um, so that, that, that's relevant. Um, we usually use a sliding scale thing. So judgment's good, judgment's fair, judgment's poor. And then there's kind of like another category we can use for folks who are really disabled or kind of things in certain neurocognitive situations and stuff. We can say judgment is adequate for ADLs kind of thing. Maybe it's like severe autism or or some kind of um, neurological condition, um, other one. Um, 
when you're testing judgment, you're just asking common sense questions. It's like you're looking for easy wins. You're not looking for like, oh, they know what to do in this complex situation. No, complexity makes this stuff hard. So why shouldn't children play in a busy road? Right? And they're like, I don't know. It'd be fun. It's a big basketball court they can run up and down. Yeah. Uh, why should we keep away from bad company? Why does land cost more when we're in a city with a billion people versus, you know, 50 yeah, that kind of thing. It's like, well, there's more people trying to live in the same space. Whatever, just simple answers. Don't don't go crazy. Um, now, there are lots of situations where insight and judgment um, that um, that cause them to be poor. Right. I'm just going to start kind of talking about a bunch of options. So, conversion disorder. They don't know. You know, they're having a neurological thing going on, and they and they don't um, understand that it's. Um, that it's actually due to stress, that kind of situation. Factitious disorder could do it, same kind of things. Dissociation, because they're not really sure what's going on right now. They're not really here. They're not forming short-term memories. Rigidity of thinking, concrete thinking, or really mess up insight and judgment, ASD, IDD, OCD kind of stuff. Um, impulse control disorders, because they just do it, and their action just goes, and... You know, um, they didn't even process the judgment. <laughs> um, maladaptive psychological defense mechanisms, that kind of thing. Um, illnesses that, that affect the central nervous system, whatever it is. Mood disorders, being depressed, anxious, manic will mess it up. Psychosis will mess up your insight and judgment. And being intoxicated or any kind of drug stuff. It can be intoxication, your currently independence, withdrawals. Those all make you have poor insight and judgment. Um, so... Insight and judgment, when are they important to not be a rubber stamp and you're just like cutting and pasting in your notes? Um, there are times where, where you should consider it. So I'll do the joke here. It says, I could go for some gum. I don't, I don't know which one's talking. I just made it up. And then it's like, I'm never talking to you again. <laughs> like a monsoon or something going on. Um, so when is it important to write? Um, so... If it's not safe for the person to discharge, like risk of harm to self, others, deterioration, you should probably say they have poor insider judgment at that point. Um, when they need treatment or there are serious consequences, antibiotics or die kind of thing, you really need to consider if it's appropriate to write poor insight, poor judgment. When they when you need court ordered treatment because you know like uncontrolled schizophrenia or something, poor insight, poor judgment it should strongly be considered if accurate. If they're wanting to leave AMA because they're sober now and they want some more meth, um, you might need to write poor insight and judgment. But just because you have poor insight and judgment doesn't mean they can't leave. That's not how you know. That's not how um, a free country works. Um, and we'll leave it at that. Um, so your your institutions will write some random combination of these things. Um, but I won't go through a bunch right now because it just doesn't matter. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, so. This has been mostly true psychiatry. We've covered everything on the mental status exam. Um, the next number of videos I'll do for a couple months are going to be about um, consult liaison topics because that'll be part of my job um, starting in a few months and gives me a good excuse to start doing a bunch of research and stuff. So right now I'm working on, I think, um, delirium will be the next one that I do. So hope this was helpful. I will see you all later. Cheers.